Mark Spike Stent has been one of the top go-to mix engineers for labels and artists for over two decades now. He's had countless hits across different genres and collected seven Grammys along the way. So what makes his style and techniques so popular? Stent started his career at Jacob Studios, where he made the transition from T-boy to engineer. Following a brief spell at Trident, he went freelance in 1987 and soon made his name with the KLF by mixing their huge hits in the early 90s. Stent's nickname was given to him at this time by Wayne Hussey of The Mission, who for some reason couldn't remember the name of the 20-year-old spiky-haired engineer who was recording the band's album Children. Since then, Stent has worked in a varied array of musical styles, but in all cases, he brings a signature approach to his work, ultra-clear, ultra-tight and hard-hitting. He worked at Olympic Studios from 1999 to 2007, after which he built the studio in Salisbury, which he says was gear-wise a duplicate of his setup at Olympic, which was centred around the SSL 4000G console. However, after a six-week stint in Los Angeles in the summer of 2007, Stent and his family decided to stay there and set up his studios eventually in Santa Monica. Again, this centred around the same SSL console, his trusty KRK monitors and the Yamaha NS10s. He's careful to stress that building the right environment to mix in is critical to getting mixes that translate well. He said that some of the most famous studios in the world are almost impossible to get good mixes in, so a lot of thought goes into making sure the acoustic environment is up to the job. Although Spike still loves to work with analog gear, including the SSL, he's not averse to working with plugins, including the Waves SSL channel itself. He said, moving to mixing in the box wasn't a watershed moment, more of a natural progression. Computer processing has become more powerful and plugins are so much better than they were. I normally use Waves plugins, the E-Channel SSL bundle. I like the Crystal and Algae plugins, the Waves Puig Child and the R-Base. For delays, I like the Sound Toys Echo Boy a lot. And for coloring things, I think the Tech 21 Sans Amp is great. Spike is not shy with compression and likes to be quite heavy handed with it. One of his favorite outboard bits of gear is the Distressor, which he uses both for drums and vocals to provide a really upfront presence. It helps that the Distressor also has some subtle harmonic distortion too, as he's a fan of warming things up wherever possible to provide character. When working in the box, he tends to subgroup the different kicks, snares, toms, and other tracks. So any kicks will be subgrouped to a kick master, the same with the snare or clap. And all that is sent to a drum master on which sub-compression is happening. So there's a lot of sub-mixing and processing, which is mostly all about compression. He said, anything more organic, more rock-like, shouldn't sound too clean or nice, so we'll often benefit from being put through the analog domain. When I begin the actual mix, I usually start with the drums. I'm of the opinion that unless you have a solid foundation, it doesn't matter what you stick on top of it, it won't sound good. Once I'm happy with the drums, I'll bring in the bass and the guitars, keyboards, and eventually the strings and so on. Again, depending on the nature of the track, of course. During this process, I'll periodically check that the vocals sound okay in the track. Once I have the instrumentation as exciting as I can get it, I'll bring the vocals in and I'll really fine tune them. Throughout this process, I'll focus on the general vibe. I'm not very clinical in my approach. I want to make sure that I get all the emotion right. One thing that sticks out for me with Spike's pop mixes is the upfront vocals. This can be shown using the distressor in this mix I'm working on. The artist here is David Zink and the Sons of Guns, and if you're interested to hear more, there's a link in the description to their Spotify page. Before I start, I'm going to minimise the breaths to make sure they don't get brought up too much by the compression I'm going to apply. A spike isn't subtle with compression. If I left them in, then it would become a little bit loud and intrusive. Here's a particularly breathy vocal from a session that Spike worked on a few years ago. I'm using two compressors here, a subtle bit of peak catching with the LA-2A and the main compression being handled by the distressor. No names were left out searching for you But I do Tall fires were burnt out no names were left out searching for you, but I do. Spike tends to use two DSs, one for subtle shaping and one more targeted to a particular frequency. I'm going to use the smooth operator here for this. This general process is fairly similar for most genres. For instance, this is how he mixed Chris Martin's vocals on Paradise. He used a combination of the Waves Diesa, the Waves Puitech EQP1A, Waves Puig Child 660, and the SSL channel, shown here. As mentioned before, starting with the drums is critical for Spike, 
Making sure the foundation is solid can mean making sure everything is in time and in phase, especially if you're using live drums or layering samples on top of existing ones. He doesn't mind blurring the lines between production and traditional straight mixing when it comes to influencing the sound choices. If he feels the drums don't have enough punch through the track, then he will freely add his own samples to make sure they do. For bass, Spike is fond of the Waves R bass and 200 Hz for good translation on smaller systems. He regularly checks on different hi-fi setups to make sure the low end is still coming across well. The NS10s are a great tool for this. He's also careful not to overload in the subregion though. Not only will this potentially blow up a system with subwoofers, it will also shrink the potential loudness of the mix, which would harm its presence in the crucial vocal area of the mix. If there's too much going on in the bass, that's mostly inaudible to the average listener. They will perceive it to be dull, and those precious dBs will get eaten up where they don't belong. His use of reverb is particularly interesting. In pursuit of clarity, he's reluctant to use much, as he doesn't like the way the reverb can wash out the 3D image he's trying to create. Because of this, he favours delays often to create excitement on vocals, for example. For this, he likes to use the Sound Toys Echo Boy or H delay. But I do. When he does reach for reverb, though, the Lexicon 480 is on hand, and plug in plate reverb from Spaces or HVerb. The mix bus contains the SSL bus comp, some broad EQ, and the L2. Having some compression and limited on the mix bus is a great way to provide loudness and presence. It has to be stressed, not to be too heavy-handed here, otherwise you could ruin your mixes pretty quickly. 